Welcome to the Hebron Public Library and our Nancy Parker Adult Program Series. Our topic tonight is choosing the best dog for your lifestyle and starting off on the right foot with your pet. We're pleased to have experienced dog trainer Mary Kozak here to share her knowledge and ideas. Mary is a volunteer trainer for the Rock County Humane Society and is active with animal rescue groups. Over the years, she has worked with hundreds of dogs. With a little bit of help from her friends, Harry and Maggie, she will demonstrate simple exercises that improve communication, bonding, and manners. After Mary's talk, your questions about dog behavior will be addressed as time permits. Please welcome Mary Kozak.
people and I ask them, can I train your dog just for fun? Can I walk your dog for free? Well, who's going to give that up? So I walk their dog for free and I train their dog. And so then I had a lot of nice neighborhood dogs I knew. So that went on for a while. And then as I got into college and everything, my dad said, you know, if you're going to do this as a hobby, you better get a real job because the way you're spending money on these animals, you're never going to be able to afford your hobby. So I went to college, I became a nurse, but then I got involved in humane societies with the political stuff, with the policies, procedures, things like that. Um, I ended up uh, working and interning with some vets and behaviorists for a while. That just kind of taught me some ropes all the time. I'm working in my real job, but never leaving sight of the animals. Um, does anybody remember Barbara Woodhouse, the um, English lady? Okay, I got to work with her for an afternoon, which was wonderful. She was great with dogs, and she was very abrupt with people, and I learned a lot from her. Um, I also worked with some really, really good vets that kind of just kind of let me get a little bit of everything because my whole passion is not to, um, I, I'm not in the showing part, I'm really not in making money, obviously. What I just wanted is to get some dogs and cats some homes and to have them to have good manners. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about today, well before I get into my groups of dogs, I'm going to tell you about my friends right here. Oh, I should tell you, when I was 16, my parents went out, finally, and they brought home a cow. Puppy. That was Nikki. Can you imagine how much attention she had? <laughs> Dixie and Lassie were gone then. I mean, you know, after all. And then, a year after we got the Border Collie, or actually, yeah, she was Border Collie, Nikki, my mom discovered she actually liked dogs and we got an Irish setter named Fredonia Maria. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when I did finally get married, before I got married, I told my husband that uh, I have a little problem that's with animals and I'm, our whole life is going to be with animals. And he's like, well, that's fine. He says, I can take an animal here or there. <laughs> uh, by the time, I think we were married like five years, I remember he came downstairs and said to me, is there any bathroom I can use where something is not looking at me? Because by that time, I branched down and started bringing sick ones home and working with humane societies and fostering. So we did all that. But then when I got married, too, I said to my mom, I go, well, we're moving just a couple blocks away from you, and I'm going to take my Freddie and Nikki with me. And she goes, oh, no, you're not. Those are my dogs. <laughs> After all that time, those imaginary dogs. So at, I moved to Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin, I got um, really associated with our Humane Society of Rock County. And I also uh, got into breed rescue. Uh, little did I know I had been doing breed rescue all along, but then it kind of took off. Um, these two. Uh, my friends. I, I only really keep two dogs of my own, and they come to me for whatever reason. Harry is a four and a half year old golden retriever. He was born on 9 11. He was adopted by a family with four children, and they loved him. They were very proud of him because they kept him in a crate 24 hours a day and only let him out once or twice a day, and they were very proud because he never messed. So we were very happy they wanted to give him up. My son had watched Air Bud and wanted a golden retriever. And I said, oh, this is going to be good. I go, do you see how many problem dogs mom brings home? Because they were, it's a steady stream going in and out. Let's do this right. You're going to learn how to go to obedience class with mom and the dog. So I applied for golden retriever rescue. And if you've never worked with rescues, it's like adopting a baby, only harder. Okay, But they do mean well. Every rescue, every breed of dog has a rescue. Sometimes, maybe not the, um, like, rare breeds, I'm thinking of a Portuguese water dog or a Kerry Blue Terrier, they probably, their breeders kind of do the rescue if they know that a dog of that breed needs a home, wants to be given up, they'll take it in. But Golden Retrievers are very, very popular. And we actually have four breed rescues around Wisconsin. Um, he came from Golden Retriever Rescue, and at the time that we applied, they were taking in 400 dogs a year, Golden Retrievers. So we applied. Um, we filled out, we got our references filled out, and then they come and they do a home visit. They want to make sure you really want a dog, and they want to make sure that you know what you're getting into with the dog. And they did our home visit, and I had a collie at the time, and um, they bring a golden retriever, and yes, this is what we want. We're a very active family, and actually, though, I would like, like a six-month-old, I want a puppy that's really hard to train, and their eyes lit up. Oh, <laughs> of course, they have nobody that ever wants to train a dog. You know, they want him trained already. And the next day I got a call and they said, well, we have a dog. He's, they told me his story and I said, oh, he sounds wonderful. So they brought him in. Now, this is a dog that had been in a cage for 
most of his life, six months. Um, he literally came in the house, and I said, what we need to do, my son is laughing because he remembers this, just let him go. I mean, he hadn't run, we just let him run for two hours. He literally was bouncing off the walls. He was jumping on the furniture. You know, at that point, talk about training and manners. This dog has been in a cage for six months, let him run. After he bounced off the walls in the house for a while, I put him on a long leash, like a 50-foot leap, took him out in the backyard and let him bounce around a little more. And then that night we decided, well, now it's time to, he's got to still go on the crate to sleep at night because we didn't want to give that up, but he also has to learn to walk on a leash and not jump on me and rip my face open. So that was the first day, and um, I'm going to talk about the gentle leaders, but that's what I use. But that's Harry's story. Now Harry was, uh, He's a very, if he's a golden retriever, but if you've seen, he's real lean, and we like to call them a field type, and these are the dogs that are really good hunters. They're very, very active. They wanna hunt, they wanna work. They need tons of exercise. We were running and walking him three hours a day, and I mean three hours a day. My husband works opposite shifts, so I had the hour in the morning, my husband did the hour at night, um, in the afternoon I did the hour in the evening, and he literally ran three hours a day. We're over that now. He's now four and a half. We walk in the morning. My husband runs him in the afternoon, and then we play at night. So we, we've made it through the hard part. So that's Harry's story, but I'll talk more about this um, gentle leader. Maggie, I had, uh, Max was my other dog that did presentations and stuff, and he did nursing homes, um, children, hospitals, the whole thing. And we lost Max in March, and I need another dog. Now, I also rescue for Collie's. There are two kinds of collies, the rough and the uh, smooth. The smooth ones look naked to me. They have no hair. I mean, they do have hair, but after having the rough ones, I just, they just, I don't know. They just look different to me. Um, I have a theory about collies that if their ears are proper and they're tipped like that, they're not crazy. <laughs> Every collie I've had with the straight up ears has been just wild. So I got a call, because now I have one dog in my house, which is very unusual. My husband was thrilled, but he knew it wouldn't last long. And I get a call, and they said, we have a mother collie and a baby that got actually tossed out of the car in Minnesota, and we can't find anybody that will take both of them. Well, I'll take them, I said. And my husband says, uh, are you taking them because you're going to keep one? I said, yeah, we're, I think I need a collie. I need a collie to work. I need to, I need to do this. So um, she came into my life. We believe this was the mother. She came with a, like a year-old puppy. Um, is what we're assuming. She came and she had a, a skin infection over her entire body and we thought she had severe hip dysplasia because she was limping so bad. So we took her in and you know, got her to the vet and everything and actually one day my husband comes up and he says, oh my gosh, you have to come right down. There's blood everywhere in the basement. You need to come down. Something is terribly wrong with Maggie. I go down and actually her hips had opened up and drained out and then she could walk really well. So obviously she must have had boils, so whatever it was. So it's, she, she does still sit funny and she's kind of boxy, but we're not too worried about her hips. But I didn't know if I was gonna keep the mommy or the daughter. We kept on going back and forth. And um, because she's like this all the time, we decided to keep her. I thought that I could get her to do these types of things and maybe do nursing homes and stuff because she has a lovely personality. Her daughter went to a family who already has her in hospice, has a, um, a therapy dog. So it's a, they're good endings for these guys, and the dogs just happen into my life. Let's talk about the seven types of dogs and certain things um, we can do when they come to your life. How many of you have dogs right now? Not too many. Well, you just must like dogs. So that, okay. We'll talk about the American Kennel Club is the largest um, club for dogs. And when, if you watch Westminster or some of those really cool shows, you notice they divide them into seven groups. So the first group we're going to talk about is the sporting group. And what kind of dogs are in sporting groups? Golden Retrievers, Labrador Retrievers, Irish Setters, Cocker Spaniels, um, the dogs that like to hunt. They're sports. They like to hunt. So when you get a sporting dog and you know they like to hunt, so they're very active, the other thing is that they like to use their mouth. That's why we like them. They pick things up for us when we hunt. So if you have older children or grandchildren, they're great because they're going to make your children pick up their rooms because they'll carry the dirty underwear out when you have company and drop it in front of your company. That's what they do. They like to pile shoes up. 
You know, because we use that mouth to our advantage. Um, my son has a really clean room now. And Harry was a little bit more hyperactive than most Goldens, but they still need the exercise. So the things that we did with him when we got him is the first of all, we, I started him on a gentle leader. Um, years and years and years ago, I mean, uh, they had the choke collars. We used to train dogs with chokes and everything. Um, and then the gentle leaders is, I think they've been out for about 20 years, but they're kind of new to me in the last seven or eight years. And going back to my father, who always had this amazing way with animals, who used to scare me because he'd go up to anything and do things we're always trained not to do. Um, he told me, he goes, you always listen to the animals and they'll tell you what they need. And when I first started training, you know, we did have the choke and we'd go to class and we'd kind of bounce them around a little bit, but he always said, you know, there's a better way and you need to listen to them. And um, what I learned, I, just, I tried this gentle leader and I think that's kind of what they were telling me. Because when I bring a dog home to rescue or foster, I put a gentle leader on right away. The theory behind them is, is that it fits very tight on the back of the neck. And when a mother dog picks up a puppy, you know how they go limp? They actually release endorphins. So we put it on very, very tight. And the thing is, if you have a collar or a choke, if you, everybody push their neck. I want you to know, push your neck right here. Just push it. That's uncomfortable, okay? But push up here. Does that bother you at all? No, that doesn't bother you. So actually, that's the only pressure the dog feels. The nose loop is just a little guide. It can direct him this way or this way. It's not a muzzle. These dogs can bite you. Not that I think they will, but they have teeth, so they could. Um, but when I'm walking down the street, a lot of people say, oh, that dog must be mean. It's got a, this on, you know, because they haven't seen it, but um, it's not, it's, see, I just gently direct, and we call it gentle leader, because we're not jerking them or anything. When they, he knows um, very well, but the thing is, the first time they get it on, all you have to do is pull it up, it exerts pressure on the back of the neck, and they sit. And so, when I get a dog in, I get a lot of goldens in, most of them are given up because they've never been trained. Um, you know, they're a big responsibility. So the first thing I do is I put the gentle leader on. If they're a senior dog or a nervous dog, if I have it on tight enough, sometimes they just relax a little bit to just go, okay, I think I, think I can do this. If they're wild, like most of the dogs I get, I have control on them. And all you have to do is pull up and they'll lay down. Now a lot of my senior dogs, or if they've been abused in any way, hit or anything like that, I keep that on while I'm with them, and it just seems to comfort them a little bit. The thing is now, you know, I've, I've had big dogs. I said I had um, Irish Wolfhounds and I've had Collies. It seems like all the big dogs are always attracted to me, and so with a gentle leader, I can walk four big dogs without a problem. If I need them to sit, I can just pull up and they all sit. So that's what I like. Um, for senior citizens, a lot of people, like them because they have more control and these dogs, they, they don't jerk you anymore. Now you have control over them. So I really like the gentle leader. And I use it with all of my dogs, with all my foster dogs. And somebody asked me about the collie. They go, well, she's so wonderful on a leash. Why do you use it? Well, when I got her, she was so nervous that um, when I put that on, she was much more relaxed. And so I really, really like it. And to me, it's just added security. Now, when I was walking up here, um, Harry was himself, and he was extremely wild, and I know people are snickering going, that's the trainer, you know, because Harry's just, he's pretty much trying to drag me up the stairs. However, I have complete control over him because he had that um, gentle leader on. So I really like it. I use that instead of collars. And I think you'll see more and more people having them. I was in Europe, <coughs> in Eastern Europe, and their dogs are allowed everywhere with them. And I was surprised the first time I didn't know that because I didn't hear anything, but all the dogs are under the table when you're eating at a cafe. And they're fine. They walk all day with their owners. And, and a lot of them use the gentle leaders. Um, it's just the dogs are, are very well behaved out there. But they're with their owners all day, and they're walking. And they're, um, it was kind of neat. I, I was just sitting down, and all of a sudden I moved my foot, and I thought I was playing footsie with the guy next. And there was a dog on the floor. So, But they're really well behaved. So that's what the gentle leaders, I really like it. Um, it's what I use instead of a collar. But going back to the, the hunting dogs, of course, so you can embarrass your kids, okay, with the dirty clothes and make them clean up the clothes. 
Um, the other thing is they love to retrieve. Now they need lots and lots of activity. So what I do, where I live I can't have a fence. And yes, I have a dog that probably could use a fence, but what I do is I get them used to the gentle leader, and I put, I get a long line, um, like a clothesline, and I, may, I get a little clip around it, and I put it on the end, and I teach them how to retrieve. So I take a ball out, and usually they'll run and get it, but the trick is having them bring it back to you. My colleague's snoring now. I'm really, I must be boring, okay. Um, yeah, wake her up. So anyway, uh, I bring the dog over to me, and as though I'm really into good nutrition, dogs will do anything for hot dog pieces. And so I always carry hot dogs with me. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten to the point of actually getting a treat box, which they have. No, I stick it in my pocket, so I always have greasy jeans. But anyway, so I have a, a little tiny pieces of hot dog, and I have the dog go out and get the ball. And then I show them what I got. The dog comes running to me, opens its mouth, I say drop, give him the hot dog, and I have the ball. They get that really quick. Then I get a lounge chair, and I sit on the lounge chair, and I keep throwing the ball. And so the dog gets all kinds of exercise. You know, you get a really, and you know, 20 minutes with the retriever running like that, back and forth getting treats. They're thinking, they're having fun. When they get back in the house, they're gonna be great. So they've learned, what you're doing then, you've learned them to, you've taught them how to be in control. You've taught them that playing ball is wonderful because you get a hot dog. You've also taught them to come back to you and drop the ball, which is gonna come in really handy when they take off. Because if you have a new dog, or an adult dog, or a dog you've been working on, they're gonna run away one time. And you're never ever gonna yell at the dog if it comes back to you because you always wanna be the best thing in the world for them. So when they come back to you, you can always, um, you know, no matter what, no, yeah, just sit there. Um, when they come back to you, of course, you tell them the most wonderful dog in the world, even if you don't mean it at the time. And Harry has taken off and jumped off a cliff into a lake, and when he comes back, of course, I'm like, oh, Harry, I really want to kill you right now. You're but you have to act like you're really happy because you never want the dog not to come back to you. You know, that's part of living with the dog. So when you get the hunting type, you know, you want to teach them how to fetch. You want to get them lots of exercise in the long line. But these, uh, when people will come to me and say, you know, my dog is ripping up the house. What am I going to do? You know, they've never taken them to an obedience class. I said, what kind of dog? I have a retriever. I said, well, you can teach them how to retrieve. And I said, you know, you really got to put in about three hours of time with them. He said, I only have three hours. I go, well, do you have 10 minutes in the morning to take them out to potty? We're going to count that as 10 minutes. He goes, well, I usually take about 20 minutes out to potty. I go, well, that's 20. I, I tell him about how we can play, you know, 20 minutes, 40 minutes in the backyard throwing the ball. And, you know, that's part of it, too. And I said, while you're doing dishes, have the dog sit by you. We're counting that. It's mental stuff. You know, anything like that. And before you know it, three hours add up, and you have a really good dog at home. So they need a lot of, lot of um, attention. And so those are our hunting dogs. The other thing with hunting dogs, they have wonderful noses. They like to come to you. They like to retrieve things. A great thing to play with your children or grandchildren is to get one of their smelly socks. Believe me, your kids have smelly socks, okay? Um, once you've taught your dog to sit and stay with you on a leash, you can add stay, have your kid with the smelly sock, drag the sack up somewhere, and first have them hide somewhere, but really simple. Like if you're in the kitchen, just have them hide around the corner, but drag the sack and just hide there. Have your kid hold a little tiny bit of hot dog. Then you can say, you know, find whoever and have your child call your dog. Well, it's easy at first, and so the dog goes around. And then as soon as that child, as soon as the dog finds it, you can give him the treat. Now this is how you train search and rescue dogs, but it's also a really fun game. Now we've played that at home for about 20 minutes and the dog's exhausted because every time it gets harder. So now we got him running up and down the stairs, all for a little bit of hot dog. And then you got him in closets and everything, but that's a really fun game for a retriever. You get him exercised and it's good because if you ever lost your kid, you just tell them to find it and they'll go find it because they know what the smell is. So, with hunting dogs, you know, you want to do fun games, you want to keep them active. A lot of times it's not enough to have a back and fence yard because sometimes a dog need, they, they need guidance, they're like kids. They need somebody to supervise the games. Now to the next group, let's go to the toys. We all know what the little toys are, the little papillons, and I call them little foo-foo dogs and New Yorkies. And they were bred to sit in warm ladies' laps. So if you want a little cuddler, just get one of those little toy dogs. Now we know those little dogs are, you know, they seem to be yappy and anxious. And I always thought, you know, my dad said always listen to the dogs. I thought they were telling me don't step on me. You know, that's why they have to yap. But 
Don't let those little toy dogs fool you. They are every bit as bright as one of these. They can sit, they can stay, they can be taught manners. But it seems like because they're little, we don't think they can, but they can very well. Um, I had a lady come to me, she had a, um, it, was, it was three pounds. It was a toy something poo. So, you know, but it was so cute. I mean, it looked like a beanie baby. It was adorable. So we fixed it with a little tiny um, gentle leader and she just couldn't believe that in you know, 10 minutes we had the dog sitting and behaving and we just, she goes, I just didn't think that their brain was to do that. I said, absolutely not. I said, they're getting away with a lot. So it is so cute to see something so tall, to you know, small, do all these things. So that's kind of fun. So those are the toy group. Then we move over to the terrier groups. And of course we have to talk about pit bulls because they're terriers. They have such a bad reputation. I got a thing over the internet talking about terriers, about can you pick out which pit bull is in here? And I, I probably should have brought it. And um, it's very interesting. There are 20 uh, dogs that you would think are pit bulls, and you have to pick which one it is, the true pit bull. And it took me about six tries. And I'm pretty good with breeds. Because when I had those imaginary dogs all that way back, I used to make flashcards of all the breeds of dogs so I could whip them through and guess them. But anyway, um, Pit bulls are terriers, they're smooth coats, and I think a lot of times people believe that any dog with kind of a pushed in face and smooth coated ears is a pit bull, and that's not true. Now the original pit bulls, um, did anybody ever watch Little Rascals, the old, old, okay. Remember Petey, was it Petey with the, that was a pit bull, okay, but they, um, that's a long time when they were bigger, now they almost look like American Bulldogs is what we see them now. They were wonderful dogs, they were family dogs. Um, unfortunately, you know, pit bulls get a little bit of a bad rap. Um, I know some wonderful pit bulls. But let me tell you about terriers. Terriers like to dig. They like to burrow. They like to scratch things because they were bred to hunt rodents. You'd be tough, too, if you were bred to hunt rodents. They're meant to dig in to a spot and pull the vermin out. Now, um, so they're wonderfully active dogs. They're, they're great family dogs because they're so active. If you are active, they make wonderful dogs to play uh, retrieve, to play games. They're very agile. You can teach them a lot of tricks. Now, there's many, many breeds of terriers. I'm talking about pit bulls because, of course, we all that comes to mind. And a lot of people don't even realize they are terriers. Cairn terriers. We have, uh, wasn't Toto, uh, Toto was a Cairn from Wizard of Oz. We have the Airedales, the largest terriers. We have Welch Terriers, Norfolk Terriers. They're wonderful little dogs. The problem is they're so cute, people don't realize how active they are. A lot of people like Westies and Karens and I go, and, they, and I say, oh, they're wonderful, and they'll settle down there about 10, because that's about it. But they're wonderful dogs. Um, they just need, they need lots of games to play. Some things I do with terriers is um, I get a Kong toy, um, it's, a, it's a rubber toy, it has holes in it, and I either put a smear of peanut butter on it, or there's toys that you can fill up with their kibble and you can let them have it, because what they're doing, they're, they're searching and digging and they're loving that, and so that's kind of a nice way to keep them busy. Um, when I was, let's see, this was 15 years ago, I moved here and I had just lost my, um, trying to think who I lost, I think it was my lab at the time, so I went to the Humane Society because I needed to have a dog right now. And I looked around and there was this darling dog looked like Benji, you know, real fluffy. Oh, it was just darling. And I said, oh, I really want that dog. And it was a Schnauzer. Oh, so they called it a Schnauzer Terrier mix. So I'm thinking a Schnauzer something. But it looked like Benji was darling. People at the Humane Society said, oh, that's not one that's going to be adopted. I said, well, why not? And they said, oh, that's a tough one. Well, I figured that was a dog for me. We took it out. The dog ignored me completely. You know, everything you're not supposed to do. And I had to take the dog home. So I took the dog home. And um, it pretty much tore apart everything we had in the house. And of course, my husband always would say, but you're the dog trainer. You need to fix this. Now, my husband said that a lot, OK? But I figured, what in the world is wrong with this dog? Um, you know, I, I, I take all my dogs to obedience class right away. And I was working with it, but this dog was just not satisfied. And um, couldn't housebreak her. Just rip apart everything, and so I decided, okay, one day I decided, I'm going to take her for a little jog. I never jogged in my life. We ran the green belt. Dog came back pretty happy. Next morning, she was sitting on my chest with her leash in her mouth. <laughs> and I thought, 
I wonder if she wants to go for a jag. So I went a little bit further. Now I'm huffing and puffing because I've never jagged in my life, but this gets, this dog needed a job. This was it. So we ran, and we ran, and we ran, and we ran, and we ran. We ran a marathon together. We ran for 13 years. Every morning at 4.30, the dog was on my chest with the leash. I missed two days because I had that flu, that bad flu, and my husband had to. But from the second day, the dog never did anything wrong. It was, that's what she needed to do. She loved to run. Now, it's kind of funny, though. It got, so my husband is a runner, and, well, I ended up being a runner, but we would go to the, um, these fun runs, and I always would ask if I could bring my dog, and I'd all start at the very end. I'd have run a leash. She's well controlled. But I need to tell you that my friends described her as Benji on hallucinogenics because it was the meanest dog you could ever, I mean, I could never let her Anyone near the house, we always had to put her away. Um, she probably would have ripped anybody apart that came within 10 feet of me in the house. She actually passed her good citizenship, uh, good canine citizen, which is you go through obedience, you go through a period of test, that means that you're pretty good on the outside, you can take her. She was wonderful once we got out of the driveway, wonderful. I took her to all the races, she was fine. It was very funny though, people would go, can I pet her? And I would, you know, have her settled, and I said, go ahead, and she would just turn her head like, oh, I just hate people. <laughs> I mean, she was just hysterical. And everybody would know her on the races, because we would do the same races every summer, and they'd leave out water for her. And, I mean, she was just a riot, and um, she just wanted to run, is all she wanted to do. And I mean, 19 miles, 20 miles, the dog just kept running. But then she started realizing that I was really slow, my husband was faster, and so we would go to a race. She'd be really embarrassed if she was in line with me. She wanted to be with him, and she'd like pretend she didn't know me. She was just a character. Um, a wonderful dog, but something that, I mean, that's way over the ordinary to go way out of your way and change your lifestyle for a dog, but this is what this dog needed to do. I don't think she could have lived with anyone else. Um, I mean, here was somebody that never ran in her life that ran marathons for the dog, but she was very funny. Um, we just loved her to death. She was one in a million, and, um, I said, once she stops running, that will be it. And so two weeks before she died, she wouldn't go out to run. And she did, she died later, very peacefully. But anyway, that was my Chelsea. So that's the Terriers. Terriers are tough, tough dogs. And um, very smart, they wanna work, they, they wanna have a job. Then we go down to the hound group. And the hounds, Irish wolfhounds, beagles, bassets. Um, somebody said, well, I'm having trouble boundary training my beagle. Well, they're born to run. And, packs and chase things. That's what it's all about. You've seen the old pictures with wolfhounds and Scottish deer hounds. They're running after something, men on horseback, you know, they're used to running. But I said to the person with the beagle, I said, well, you can boundary train your beagle. Just tell her what state you live in. <laughs> so, but really, you can train them. They're just, they, they have great noses. Now, I, I've heard this. I think bloodhounds can smell one drop of urine in a bucket of water. I, I, that's how strong it is. Their noses get them, take them away. That's what we use their noses for. And so beagles, if they get a scent, they're gone. Same thing though, you know, we've got, um, I, I've trained beagles without a price. You know, we start with the gentle leader. We start with all, it's nice if you can train them how to retrieve. You do the same thing. You take them to obedience class. You do all those neat types of things. Um, it's nice if you have a big fenced in area or you can use a dog park and you can have them play with other dogs and get them tired. A um, good dog's a tired dog, and so with your hounds, people a lot of them say that they're not very bright, but I think they're very bright, I think they're very sweet, I think their nose just gets them into trouble. Um, beagles sometimes are, are, are chewers. Um, basset hounds and beagles like to talk and bay um, and howl. Uh, my Harry was a howler and a barker at anything. And what I did, um, especially at squirrel time, that's in the summer about six o'clock, so I got a spray bottle, and um, every time he barked, I just said, quiet, quiet. One million times I did it. <laughs> but what he was doing, when I started to say quiet, he started whispering, so we'd go, <laughs> <laughs> So I thought, this is cute. So then I told him whisper. And so now when the bunnies come out, I just tell them to whisper, and that's not as obnoxious as bang. And um, probably a good idea to try that with some of maybe the beagles or so. But the idea is you, you can teach them all different things if you just spend the time. And sometimes it takes a lot of time. Now when you, oh, what did you hear? <laughs> oh, you heard baby, yeah. Um, you want to find some smelly socks, that's what you want. Um, then 
The next, uh, let's go over to the, the working dogs. It used to be one group, working dogs, German Shepherds, Rottweilers, um, Akitas, Huskies, Malamutes. These are dogs that worked for a living. They used to have Collies and the herding group in there too, but they divided it. Now the working dogs, uh, let's see, what else is, uh, you know, the, the Malamutes, the Huskies, the Samoyeds, those are known to pull sleds, to work. The Malamutes are, are, are big Huskies because they can pull large amounts of things and they were used quite a bit. And of course we have our Huskies that, that pull sleds. Um, German Shepherds and Rottweilers, they're used for guarding. Um, the best thing, German Shepherds are very good because a lot of times they'll let you in the house, but they don't let you out. Mm -hmm. those, those are good guard dogs. And a lot of times when they used to train those dogs, you know, uh, guard dogs, they would lay in your house and they'd let them come in and then they would just stand there. And the guy, you know, you'd find your robber or whatever standing there at the dog because, you know, they knew the dog would do something. So um, if you've ever, if you know German Shepherds, you can, they're just kind of a little suspicious. They're just like checking you out. And um, they're, they're just, they're brilliant. They're just brilliant. And, and the key to getting a good dog is to getting one that you're a little smarter. And some of the Shepherds, the rest, some of the working dogs, well, you really got to be up on your toes because if you're not smarter than them, if you don't keep them busy, they'll take advantage of that. Not because they want to, but they figure if you can't take charge, they have to. And so uh, German Shepherds, when I have a German Shepherd, uh, boy, I just start them right away. We just go to obedience, we do agility, we do all those things. Um, an important thing to do with, with Shepherds is to, and with all dogs, is to let them know what a crate is about. Um, I crate train all my dogs. I feel that having them in a crate when I'm not home is better than coming home to a house that's going to cost me about $20,000 to repair, you know, because they can get into mischief. All my dogs, even when they're out of the puppy stage or out of the new fosters, chick, don't do that, you're on camera, out of the fostering stage, I have them take a nap in their crate every day because I don't know if they're ever going to be sick and they have to go spend a night at a vet. I don't know when I'm going to have to board them. And so they're just used to going into a crate for a nap. And so if I do have to take them to a vet or board them, they're great. I have elderly parents that I visit, and so um, I like to take my family with me, and I like to be invited back. So I take crates with me because even though, of course, I have my father who does things that just scares me, um, my mother's a little fragile, and so I can put my dogs in crates. They can be quiet. It's just a safe place. Crates are not bad. It's a really good thing. And if you're first time owners, I think it's a really, really good thing, especially, it gets you a little bit more control. And if you're first time owners and you're getting frustrated or you have a puppy that just oh, is, you know, it, it is hard to train, it's a good place to put them. And if they're used to it, they'll be quiet because then you're gonna get frustrated. And then you never wanna take that off of the dog. So our working dogs especially, very, very bright, um, definitely need to go to school with them. The um, herding group would be collies. They come in two varieties. I kind of mentioned they have a rough and a smooth. Um, we have border collies, and border collies are supposed to have the number one IQ of dogs. They scare me because to train them, I just let them read the book, and then I tell them to report <laughs> back. They are so bright. That's just so scary, you know. Before the training's over, it's done. They're like very, very, very good. Um, very high energy, um, sometimes get in the wrong hands because if people know they're smart, but you have to be, you have to be a little bit ahead of them because there's, you know, they just, they need a lot of activity. They need somebody very active. People that really, really want a border collie that are not as active, I just suggest get an older one from a rescue because um, six, seven, eight, they're still very active, but they're, they're pretty well trained by then. And maybe they'll fit in better in a lifestyle. Um, we have the Australian cattle dogs. Um, we have the Pembroke. Um, Corgis, the queen dogs, or I can't remember if they're cardigan or pen, but one of the ones without the tail, of course, the queen has. And they are, they are meant, and they have an instinct to nip at heels to herd things. My um, collie here, who my husband describes as a couch potato, goes crazy when she sees a sheep or a goat. I, and I was surprised. You never know how much instinct they have until they come about that. But all of a sudden, she goes into the collie mode, you know, watching and making sure they're around. Now, I didn't know she had such great instinct. And I was talking to somebody before we started, but um, she and her puppy came to me. 
and I'm very proud about never having my dogs loose. They're always perfect, you know. They're never out in the neighborhood, never unattended. And I had them, I have a, a six foot fence um, on the back of the house, and I left them out for a little while because I left my dogs out in the fence. It's locked and everything, and my neighbor rang the doorbell. And she said, I think your dogs are loose. And I said, oh, my dogs are never loose. She says, no, I, you better come over. There's two collies. So first I ran down to the fence. They had taken a nail out of the plank and moved it over and snuck out. It was still swinging. <laughs> my neighbors have triplets, children that are three years old. They were out running in the yard. She and her daughter had herded them without nipping into a wading pool. And the three triplets were just standing there like this while the dogs were just like this. And my neighbor says, can I have them? She goes, I can't keep track of them. I didn't even know the dog. And so what our collies do, they chase things, especially children, because they think they're sheep. <laughs> and um, they herd them. And that's when we get the nipping. And I think people misinterpret that. The other thing I've noticed with collies, this is my fourth rough collie. See, ever since my imaginary dog, I always had to have a collie. That's all from that imaginary thing. Um, she, um, I forgot what I was going to say about children, but um, anyway, I forgot. It'll come back to me. So uh, with the hurting, what was I going to say about children? Oh, I know. People sometimes misunderstand, you know, the nipping. Now, all of my collies, I've had all rough collies. I've had three with the ears that are down. Remember I told you those are the nice ones? I've had one with the ears up. Woo -hoo. Okay. But anyway, they, um, if she thinks somebody's in trouble, she grabs my arm and will pull me gently. And mainly if she, they go, they've been hearing children out here, and he loves children, but she especially, and she's very alert because if she thought somebody was in danger, they usually don't grab me. They want me to help. And that's, I think, you know, that's a nice instinct. And maybe that's why Lassie was so, you know, famous. So, um, but that's our colleagues. The last group is called the non-sporting group. And um, it's a miscellaneous group. And I'm not quite sure why they put them there, because some of the dogs in that group are um, chows, which were used for guard dogs in China. Um, Dalmatians, which were carriage dogs, which I would think are working dogs. Um, the poodle, but that's okay. So we, we have another group, and it's just kind of a whole, if you've ever watched the dog show, it's kind of neat because it's one group that they're all just so different. And with this group, I want to take Dalmatians. Dalmatians are very hard-working dogs. They were bred to run with carriages. And you know how carriage would run cross country. That's what they were bred for. So those dogs can run and run and run. But when we had that movie that came out, 101 Dalmatians, and those puppies came out, people just had to have a Dalmatian because those puppies were darling. And a lot of people got them and didn't realize that these dogs really, really need a lot of work. They are very active. They're wonderful dogs. They, they need a lot of work. So, you know, sometimes when dogs become popular, um, it's not so good because what you see is a finished product. If you've seen the Air Bud movies, which is why my son was interested, my son then, after we had had Harry to three classes or four classes, we kept going, he realized how much work a puppy was. He goes, Mom, I don't think I ever want a puppy. They're a lot of work. I said, and that's, and I said, we did it right. We socialized him, we got him through classes, you know, this is what we need to do. But people see those golden retrievers and you see Air Bud, who's already trained and wonderful. I do have to tell you, the first week that we got Harry, we didn't know if he would run. We wanted to keep him in the yard, so we had him on the long line. And we realized he loved balls a lot. And we decided to play basketball with Harry, with a long line. Okay, don't ever do this, okay? Harry, has anybody ever seen Dennis Rodman, the Chicago Bulls basketball player? Okay, he was very good in defense, okay? Harry would jump up, steal the ball from you, tangle you up with the line, and give you a rope burn. So, yeah, he wasn't really fair. So he was a great defensive player, but we realized never put a long line on him and never show him a basketball outside. He's, he's older and wiser now, so of course he doesn't do that, but um, he was quite the dog. We're all tattooed from Harry now because all three of us got the uh, tattoos that really hurt. So, uh, you know, we've come a long way. 
Let me tell you a little bit about um, what? It's almost over. <laughs> I tell you about if you're looking for a dog. Is anybody here looking for a dog? Or okay. Let me tell you a few different ways. Now, from my history, I don't breed dogs. Um, and I've had a lot of uh, exposure to rescues and humane societies. And what are you getting up for? We're not done yet. You want to hold? I can stay That's going to be by his boy. Just keep him by you. He gets out of hand, get back. Um, I can tell you what I know from humane societies. Um, humane societies get in a variety of dogs. There's a great website. If you're addicted to dogs, you can just look at it. If you're really looking for a dog, it's a nice thing. It's called petfinder.com. Honey, let me have because he's just going to get in her purse. I, I know that already. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Petfinder.com is, um, has about, I think, half a million animals on it. Uh, you should, normally, rescues and humane societies will post a picture and a biography of the animal. And the dogs up there, just about all of them have been temp temperament tested. Now, I know Rock County Humane Society temperament tests, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what they do. And so the dogs that are put up for adoption at the Humane Society have been tested, and there'll be a little bio of what they're all about. Now, a lot of people are looking for the cute, fluffy terrier types. And I know the Humane Societies get them, but a lot of times they're not advertised because they go. They go fast. So there are rescues. Now, a rescue, I can't tell, every breed of dog has a rescue. Um, some rescues special, like Goldens, Collies. Some rescues specialize in mixed breeds just for families. And um, some rescues specialize in Peekaboos, um, you know, Maltese's, whatever you're looking for. This pet finder is wonderful because it's nationwide. And some people do adopt out of state. The rescue I work for for rough collies, collies are not that popular and we like that. So we do five states. Um, and we have something called a cur. It's a canine underground railroad, which means we transport, like each of us drives 60 miles to get to the place. So if you get to Pet Finders, petfinder.com, it will come up what your zip code is. You put in your zip code, you put down what kind of dog you're looking for, male, female, adult, puppy, senior, um, and, you, and um, then it'll come up with breed. They have all the breeds of dogs, so you can click on the breed, and it's gonna come up what dog is closest to you. Now, if you're looking for a dog, and you find a dog, and you think like, oh, I love that dog, but it's out in California, email that person, because sometimes rescues are stationed someplace, but they know of other places nearby. So if you're looking for a particular breed, maybe an older one, you might wanna do that. Most rescues temperament test the dogs also. The thing about rescues, uh, as compared to a humane society, is that you know, the humane society, a lot of them are strays, but a lot of them are home owned. So you can get a history and kind of know the dog, and they've been there a little while, but you're going to get, you, you kind of know a little bit about the personality of the dog, but when you get one from a rescue, the dog has lived in a house with a person for a minimum of two weeks, and so you'll know exactly what you're getting. Now, mind you, when a dog comes into humane society, they're temperament tested. The only time we're very, very concerned is if we see aggression, and I'll show, I'll show how we test them. Those dogs are not placed. They usually retest them in about two weeks because once the dog becomes comfortable living in the cage or going out, you're gonna see a different dog. Now, fostering, what I do, this is my own way, whenever I get a new dog in the house, it is isolated from everybody but myself. It doesn't see any animals, it doesn't see my husband, it doesn't see my child. I give it a few days to unwind because they're, they're pretty nervous, and then I start introducing to everybody. And then slowly I get them upstairs and I can see what they're doing. And usually I take about a month before my dogs go out. But with the rescues, you get a whole write-up about what you're getting. And a lot of people who don't want to, um, you know, take the time to raise a puppy, but they want an adult, if you like, if you don't, if you're looking for a mixed breed, then check out the Humane Society, check out Pet Finder. If you want a specific breed, check out this. If you want a dog um, that you know its heritage very well, purebred, go to a dog show and talk to the people, um, the breeders, and find out what they're all about. If you are going to get a puppy, you really should wait till they're about eight weeks old, and if, it's wonderful if you can see the mom. We can kind of tell about how the puppies are, and for new owners, we like to say, get a middle of the road puppy, so go with somebody that knows the temperament. You don't want a real bold puppy if you're, you know, 
you don't want the puppy that I would pick up, is, is what we'd go. So some people let me go with them to choose the puppy. And if, if you're going with a breeder, the breeders usually know the puppies inside out and they would select one for you. But um, people take me with, and the ones that I would choose, those are the ones not to, because I always want the problems. That's what I like. Uh, so, you know, it works out. But those are some good ways. And I just want, you know, just to basically, boy, see, this is, this is what I get here. Okay. Now, when we temperament test a dog, I've never been bit. I can tell you when somebody wants to bite me, but I've never been bit. I take my right hand with me. This is right. It's really left. But anyway, I take this. We do a, a series of tests on the dog. When I go to a humane society, um, the humane society will call me if my breeds that they know are there. And they'll say, will you come and check it out? And I will check it out and then find a foster home. If Sometimes they know I know Goldens, they know I know something, and if they have a beautiful Golden or something, and they'll say, could you just come and give us a second opinion, because there might be some aggression, and they just want a second opinion before they need to do what they need to do. But anyway, some of the things, well, you're sleeping anyway, so I'll just step on your leash. So when I get, you know, a dog, we just get into a, a little room here, and uh, we just start, we pet them a little bit, and we try and go kind of quick, but what I'm doing, I want to see if there's any reaction at all. Is he, you know, He's letting me touch him all. Now, he's, we've done this a million times. So um, what I'm looking for, is he going to put his fur up? Is there something he doesn't like at all? So I just kind of test. And we go very slowly. If there's any indication that he's not liking what I'm doing, I'm going to stop. You like that on your mom. <laughs> now, the last thing that we would do with a dog that we think, oh, yeah, you know, they're, they're doing fine. They want attention. They're looking at us. They're, you know, the fur's down and everything. The last thing we're going to do is a hug, but we're going to hug him so they can't bite our neck. And he won't, I mean, you know, we get it so that if he would go, it'd be the back of our head. And we only do that if we think we're absolutely safe. Now, why did we do all that? Well, when we take a dog home, we want to make sure he doesn't have anything that's causing him pain that would cause him to bite. The other thing is, is if this dog is really, you know, a, a nice dog in nature, and a child came, well, no, kids are, they're going to go over him. Well, if he's going to react, we want to know that. We want to know if he's, um, you know, if he's, if he's safe with kids. So we do that, and then in about two weeks when he's in the house, we do that again. Now, when I get a new dog, I am constantly touching my dogs. I'm doing that while I'm watching TV or yelling at the kid or something. You know, I'm just touching him because, you know what, when he has to go to a vet and the vet has to do that, he, this guy could care less. I can do anything to this dog. Now, when I first got him, I could not do anything. Now, for him, he runs every day. And he gets, he'll get sores on his pants, so I have to give him a special lotion. Now, I couldn't touch his feet when I got him, but now I can, you know, do this. Now, and it did happen overnight, it took a few months. But he was real leery because he was in a cage for a few months and nobody ever touched him. But now I can do anything to him. With him, especially, the dogs don't like their nails cut a lot, and so that's really hard thing to do. And I think everybody should be able to cut their own dog's nails. It's much easier. So, you know, we sit them, and after a few months of just giving me paw and rubbing his nails, I just took the clipper once and just clipped off the edge, and that was it. Next day, I took his paw, and I just rubbed his nails, and I clipped a couple. And pretty soon, he just sits up on a little bench for me, and he clips his nails. I can clip his nails completely. But I have to do that a lot because, you know, we just never, we never want to give that up. Um, what else? Okay, so then, so we've touched the dog all over. That's part of the temperament testing. And if you go to Humane Society or if you go through a rescue, they will explain how the dog reacted. The main thing with that is that if, if a little child came up and went like this, I want to make sure that dog's not going to react. They all have teeth. They'll all bite, okay? I'm pretty confident this dog would never bite anybody. However, believe it or not, this dog was very dog aggressive. He was rawhide possessive. And he's toy aggressive. And now you would not notice all this, but I work with him. Which the next thing we do, we take toys. We take squeaky toys and balls. And we give it to him. The brother will take it. And then we just try and take it away from him. Now, if he's got a good clamp on it, I just give him a little hot dog and see if he'll take it that way. I don't have one, but, um, but a dog that won't give up its toy, what if he was running around at home and a little kid went to take the toy, what's going to happen? Now, he had this issue for a while, 
And so what I did, I just kept on giving him a treat, taking it away, giving a treat, taking it away, absolutely keeping him away from anybody else in the family with toys until I knew that he realized we weren't going to rip it out of his mouth or he would, you know, you want to hold it? He would, um, you know, he, he wasn't possessive anymore. When we got a second dog, he would just attack her if she went anywhere near his toys. And so I kept them on gentle leaders. My husband would have one, I had one, we would have two toys, and we just kind of worked it out slowly, slowly, slowly. Lots of patience, lots of patience. He probably wouldn't have been a dog that I would have adopted out to a family. That was my opinion. Now he's great, but it took a lot of work. Um, what we do then is we take um, kitty food. What dog could resist kitty food? And we'll go back. And we'll put it in a bowl, and we'll take my friend here, and we'll move it around. We'll touch his face, we'll move the bowl. Now, you know, some dogs are going to rip the arm apart, okay? That's a dog that's not going to be up for adoption. Um, there are too many good dogs to put up dogs that could possibly injure a child or an adult. There are some dogs that might. Um, you know, make a little bit of a growl or something. As long as we're not snarling or showing teeth, you know, there's ways to work at it. But that's a dog, if they have any indication, that will be a dog that would go to an adult family, probably. If there's severe stuff, like um, my hand was snapped in half from a golden retriever um, without warning. Um, we had to euthanize that dog. There was no way, he was a beautiful dog. It was a shame. It's the only thing he did wrong, but whatever was in, there's no way we could have done that. The dogs that don't care at all, those are the ones that are going to be the family dogs. And most of them are. Most of them are. So he used to carry this around for me all the time, but I don't know if he, uh, there's some bad smells. Look at this to see it was broken. You can see we have a fracture here, but I never got it fixed after that last time. So those are some of the tests. I'm getting to, um, getting to eight. Maybe I will, maybe I will stop here and maybe if anybody has any questions. Oh no, oh no, oh thank you for bringing that up. Um, this lady is wondering about the canine rescues where the dogs come from and um, I would say 75% of our dogs are home owned dogs that come in and have a history. They're the ones that usually never make it on the website because we have applicants. Um, the others are strays. Um, they're given up most of our dogs, well let me talk about golden retrievers, I know golden retrievers. Most of our golden retrievers are between 6 and 18 months old, and the people bought them because they were puppies, but they realized they were way too much work. And that's most of our dogs. Our seniors, um, we have people going through life changes, divorce and things like that, they give up our illnesses. Um, and also then the shelters call us, and we, we get those in. Um, so there, a lot of them have really good histories. I just. I just got a very expensive golden retriever puppy that came to rescue because the breeder just didn't um, want to, um, something might be wrong with the dog, and she says, I really don't want to spend the money on the dog. I sold it once it was returned, and I think I got a gold line right there. She is absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous confirmation. She's a wonderful dog, but you know, um, bone surgeries cost a lot, and the dog, and that's what the rescues raise money to help the dogs. and so. We really want to work well with breeders. We try. We want to work well with humane size. We want to work well with the public because we're just a lot of people that love this type of dog. And so you can get wonderful, wonderful dogs. And I mean, some of the dogs that come in are perfectly trained, and it's wow. just they just kind of walk in the house, and they're great, you know. So I had this like pictured in my mind that they were problem dogs we wouldn't want. <laughs> There's many reasons people give up dogs, and and. Problem dogs, when you say six months to 18 months, you know, the problem is they haven't been trained. And, you know, I, I usually get the, that's what I do mostly is, is the young ones, but you know what, in two weeks, I got a great dog. Because the first day they have to walk on a leash with this gentle leader, and um, they can't jump. And then um, about the third day they realize if they don't sit still for the gentle leader, they're not going outside to play, and they get it really quick. Dogs don't want to be in charge. They really don't. They want someone else to be in charge. And some of the aggression that I've seen with people that are having problems with the dog is, if you look at the person, like say for dog aggression, when a dog walks by and goes, I've noticed the owner is so nervous. 
And so what we do, we, we get, um, we like to get her with the gentle leader, and then I walk the dog, and then I want her, and then I start walking with them, and, and it works out pretty good, because once the dog realizes that, oh, I don't have to do it, you know, they don't want to be management, they're fine, they're fine, and, and a lot of them are fearful with that, but they, uh, most of them come around, but no, sometimes on the website, I think, our websites or whatever, they advertise the problem dogs, so you don't realize how many dogs are not problems because we get so many applicants that they go out. Now our collies, we have a small rescue and so all our collies are advertised, but then again, you have to remember that the foster person might be experienced, might not be experienced, and they're putting the biography up there too. But the nice thing is, is that you get to see the dog in their home, you get to see the dog in your home, you get to decide if this is a dog for you. So it, it's a nice way of not having to go through the housebreaking stage. Um, our rescues where, um, you know, the dogs are all vetted. So they've been spayed or neutered, and they have all their shots, they've been examined by a vet, they have to know basic manners, they have to be housebroken. And so you do pay an adoption fee, but that's all, it's included, it really is a deal. So you have somebody else like do the dirty work. I mean, I, I thought that was great. When I had puppies, because I used to let my puppies go out at 12 weeks, when I would get them in, and, and they were already housebroken, and I had them doing manners and everything, and um, I thought that was a pretty good deal, you know, to have a good start. So I mean, you can be lucky, but you know, be choosy, and you know, some t the dog will, I don't know, are you looking for a particular breed, or? I'm, I want a larger dog, and I thought, was thinking about a black but <laughs> not sure. I don't know that much about the breed. I've been looking. Yeah. Do you just like the way they look? Is that? I'm just, why you're yeah, I've always loved that dog. Yeah. Or, you know, or uh, my grandfather had a collie, a big tricolor collie uh -huh. when I was little. Yeah. And it was a really nice dog, but they're really very. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to tell you though. I this dog sheds much less than this one because of the coat. She sheds in tufts. Um, you know, and so I have yeah, a lot of those dust bunnies around, but his hair is everywhere. Yeah, the lamps shed a lot too. So well, they, they shed, yeah, they, they shed. shed. So it depends what color hair you want to wear, but. Um, <laughs> I have a white cat. <laughs> and well, you know, in Terry, a lot of the terriers shed so little, you have to groom them. So there's a lot of options. But go, you know, um, the American Kennel Club has a really good um, website to learn about all the breeds. Yeah, and then, of course, you can type in your breed that you're looking for, you know, because then you can find your activity level and everything else. But you want to be sure when you get a friend, because it's, it's a big commitment, so. And they don't mind being crated. Like, I work eight hours a day, but come home at lunch for a half hour. They don't mind being in the crate four hours they, in the morning. They, um, you know, you now some of the dogs that I've gotten have never been crated. We have a little struggle at first. But I make the crate the best place in the world. That's where they get peanut butter. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where, um, and I have them sleep. But if you come in, you know, four hours. And it's not that, you know, actually, you know, if you're looking for an adult dog, mm -hmm. um, you know, some people, you get a six, seven year old that already has been in the house and is wonderful, you may not have to. But actually, um, I, there's very few, I can't remember a dog that I haven't talked to crate. I would say 50% of people I adopt out do not create their dogs, which I, I'm always encouraging people to because it, it just makes it easier for me. But um, no, they, they really like their crate. In fact, my when I had my dogs got to be 10, 12, or whatever, we never told. We just left the doors open on the crates, and they just went in their crates when they would sleep. And you know, now my wolfhound was this big, and so he outgrew most of the crates, and so we got him a toddler bed with rails, <laughs> and that's that's what he was in, you know. But. Yeah, but it's all the good, you know, it's just, and, and when you get, a, if you get a foster dog or an adult dog or something, go to an obedience class with, with him, you know, find the class that you like. Um, I have just, you know, find somebody that that you trust, and it's humane, and you're communicating well with your dog, and, and you're going to bond so much better. So, did you have a question? Um, isn't it true that, um, as far as creating a dog, like when you're, while at your work and stuff, I've been told that um, the dog thinks that it that the crate is his home, and 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 the reason that dogs who are left home alone, not crated, choose things is because they are lonely. Well, and so you're asking about how they like a crate, how they see a crate, and why you probably hear about separation anxiety, why they go a little crazy when you're not home, and. 
Dogs are den animals in the wild, so there's a little bit of instinct in there. So actually they feel safe in a crate and it is. It's like their home. Um, and actually, if you've ever watched dogs all day, they sleep most of the time when they're gone, you know? And so to sleep, you know, an adult dog, eight hours in a crate, puppies, you really need to let them out in between, but they would be just fine. It, when dogs are alone, I think when they, they chew up or do things, a lot of it, they're anxious because they have nobody telling them it's not right, you know? And I mean, some of the things they do, like, um, okay, the foster home he came from didn't crave him, which, so she says, oh, he only tore her two beds. Oh, <laughs> well, he had a ball. He had two other dogs in the house. They're just ripping stuff all over. Well, what's that teaching him? Nobody's telling him not to. It's teaching him it's okay to rip these things up, and he's having a ball. I don't think he was anxious. I don't think he was upset. I think he was having a blast. I think they were ripping things, and it was just fun. Um, but I'm not going to come home to a place like that. And so the crate, for one thing, is a safe place to put the dogs. You know, and you know, make sure you have a good crate because there have been issues where the dogs, you know, got through there. But you know, invest in a good crate. Make sure they feel secure in there. And then when you come home, it's going to be great because they're going to be really happy to see you. You're not going to yell at them. But how it's terrible to come home and find a mess in your house, you know. And you know, years ago, I didn't believe in crating 30 years ago, and so we got our first, we got a lab, and ate the cable for the cable TV ate the couch, oh. and I'm like, why is he doing that? Why? You know, and I had read the stuff, but I didn't realize it, you know, until it's like, oh, duh, you know. And it was my husband, I thought you were the trainer, you know. So we always got into that. But anyway, I've learned since then, yes, they love crates, and it's a good, safe place, and they don't mind it at all. And you know, when you get a puppy, sometimes you're training, you get really frustrated sometimes. You know, what a good place. You don't yell, put the dog in the crate. That's safe for them. Take a time out for yourself and for the dog. Unwind and go back. Now this new puppy that I have fostering right now, who's just a doll, she was not crate trained, although they told me she was. So she howled for three nights. That's kind of long for a little puppy, but you know now, when it's nighttime, she gets her little treat, she goes in her crate, and what a good place because when they've had enough of her, when I've had enough and I can't watch her, she goes right in her crate, she's very happy, and she just cuddles up and she's fine. So, and now I know she's not gonna, I know, and she's very oral because she's a retriever, so I know she's not gonna choke on something when I'm not around, you know? So it's just, it's just a good, safe place. So, yeah, there's really good articles too on the web about crates and why they're good, so. You put food and water in there? I, I don't, and, um, because it's. Well, then you have to let them out, right? <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, it's gonna be all over. They dump it immediately. And if you, you know, a puppy, you know, somebody really, you need to have the responsibility to let them out, water them, feed them, because they shouldn't go a really long time. But when they're adults, I mean, they're they're fine. They can be without it. I do, though, give them a Kong with peanut butter in, so they they have something to, you know, to do. You gonna say hi to everybody? Okay. But, but and that's, the only time I would give a real special treat, like a Kong, is when I'm gonna put him in the crate, and they used to look forward to me leaving, because that's the only time they ever got it. But it's, there's, and then they fall asleep, and they don't even know you're gone, you know, so. Thank you very much. Or do you have another question? I didn't. I have to tell you a funny story about a Doberman that we had at one time. We had, we looked in a big house and it was an open stairway. Uh -huh. And the only thing that he would do is that um, he, he, lear he learned how to open doors. They had the, the you know, where he had to twist the doorknob. Uh -huh. He would always go into my kids' I have a daughter and then two boys that shared one room. He would always get my daughter's cabbage patch dolls who that had dresses on. He would get those dresses off the dolls, not rip them. Just pull undress the dolls. Undress the dolls. I'm a little and then, worried about that dog. Yeah, and <laughs> carry them into the boys' room uh -huh. and then the my son sucks which he never chewed up, would end up in my daughter's room. Then my boyfriend was always hard on him, uh, punishing him and you know doing this and that. He would go into our room, get gym socks, and he would chew them to pieces. But he wouldn't chew nothing else. And, no, and so what we tried to do so he wouldn't go upstairs is that we would pile chairs up, like dining room chairs, and no matter how high we piled, that dog still got upstairs. 
and he wouldn't move a chair and we couldn't figure out how he did it. That was his job and he did it well. Yes, he um, did. I, I do have to tell you, I have, um, I used to leave my dogs in a tri-level and we would close the door and my lab kept getting out and I had no clue how. Then one day, okay, this is, this is how weird it is. We go around, we left and we went around to the window and we're looking in and waiting, waiting, waiting. The cat would get on the back shimmy the door open, get the door open, and let the dog out. So I thought, now that was working as a team. Just, you know, they're, they're resourceful. They're very resourceful. We grew up with a, a, a Boston Terrier, and my brothers had hamsters. And of course, they always play at night. So these little hamsters are in their cages. Well, one got out, and Sugar, the dog, knew, you know, it wasn't supposed to be loose because it's always in their case. He got up, or he would go and jump on my parents' bed. Never do this any other time. Never jumped on their bed or anything. Kept, kept jumping on them and barking. And you know how dogs act like when they want the, you to follow them? Like well, Timmy and Lassie, right? Yeah, and Lassie. that's what she kept. That's what she kept doing. And they had to, you know, go through the living room and go through the kitchen. And he, Sugar, was leading them right into the bathroom. And we, our washer and dryer was in the bathroom. Hamster was in the, um, the exhaust thing for the dryer. You could hear him scratching inside of there. And he directed my mom and dad right, right to where the hamster was. You had your search and rescue dog right there. Yeah. Yes, I wouldn't recommend hiding your hamster to get the dog, but there <laughs> you go, they worked out yeah. very well. So it was it was interesting, it was kind of neat. They're wonderful, yes. My mother would like a dog, and she'd like a small, kind of gentle dog. Uh -huh. But we have two cats, uh -huh. and one is 20 years old. Uh -huh. Do you think introducing a new animal into a house with a 20 year old cat with three teeth <laughs> well, I have three 16-year-old cats at my house. They make all the foster dogs. They train the new puppies. If she's looking for a small dog, though, if you went for a rescue, a lot of those dogs have cat experience, and that would be noted. So the dog is just used to the cats. And sometimes if you get a little bit of an older dog, a small dog, they're not so, you know, it's fine. And like with the dogs, what I do, the first few days, I keep them separated, um, you know, and then, you know, I, I let them look at each other. I had, when I got a new cat, I don't know how a new a cat can be new when it's 15, but anyway, see, I have this thing for old cats at the United States. Like, every time I go there, they have another 15-year-old that has no place, so, you know, I gotta bring it home. But anyway, but I, I have a big cage, and I would just keep the cat there because they're not used to anything different. And I would recommend it for a cat's already living there, but the cat got to look at the whole house from the cage, how perfectly safe. Dogs got to sniff at everything else, and he'll chase, he'll chase if he's, if he's allowed to, but by the time the cat came out, they kind of like, oh yeah, he's lived here. So if you take it slow, and you pay a lot of attention to the cat, and I imagine the cat's probably not so mobile anymore. Um, also, you know, if you get an older dog, it's not so bad, a dog with history. The other thing what I do is a lot of collies chase cats, even though you know, they're, they're good, they will if they get up. I have a, a gate and I just cut a little hole so that the cat can go through but the dog can't. And so for emergency purposes, you know, because we, we leave up a gate in our family room so that the cats get time with us because with two dogs and a foster puppy, the cats aren't going to be able to sit on our laps very well. And so we give everybody ample time. But there's ways to, to do that, you know, to introduce it. But I think if, if your cat is fine with other animals. Um, no? The cat hates the other cat. Oh, it hates the other cat, but maybe it might, it might like a dog. I don't know, it doesn't like yeah. people much, but me. This I, always been like I've had cat. animals like that too. Yeah. I've had a cat for 16 years, I've petted her twice now, I don't know why. But anyway, but the thing about rescue, if you bring an older dog in, they can bring the dog to your house and you can see exactly, you know, give you a good example of how it's gonna be, which is nice. So you can try that, but I, I've done really well with cats and dogs together. In my house, they all have to live because if you want to eat, you better get along. I just don't have time for anything else. So, so good luck, good luck. <laughs> but try an older one. 
And there's dogs that absolutely love cat. I've had dogs in foster that we had to have them go to a house with a cat, which, you know, teach us all. And there's cats that really like dogs too. And there's cats that don't like other cats that like dogs, so you never know, you'd be surprised. Any other questions? Or? Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Hopefully you'll find some something furry to spend your life with.